Okay, uh, hello everybody and uh, welcome to the next uh, Ipanema scientific online lecture. And we have now um, a presentation from Argentina from the University of Buenos Aires by Professor Eduardo Corton, uh, who will tell us about Argentina in general and the specific research uh, from his lab uh, but uh, particularly on biosensing focus. So, Eduardo, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Ivana, for your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Ipanema Consortium. We are very happy to, to be able to participate. For, for us, it's, it's really very important stuff. My students are all very happy to have the opportunity to, to visit your labs and try to and try to push our, our research into, into devices, commercial devices, products. So it's going to be very good for us. Okay, something about the Argentina, a few slides, something about my group, and then some technical stuff about research. Argentina, as you know, is a federal republic, capital of biggest cities, Buenos Aires, where I live and where the University of Buenos Aires, of course, is. Uh, located. Uh, see. And frozen. Yeah. Uh, we are in the south part of South America. It's, it's a relatively large country. It's just a little small like India. 6,000 kilometers from north to south. Narrow, tropical weather in the north. Very cold weather in the south. Very close to the Antarctic Peninsula. 10,000 kilometers to reach Spain, not very far away. We have, we are in a very Pacific neighborhood now. All our neighbor countries are friends. 40 years ago, we had some problem with Chile. We dispute about three little islands in the south, but the Pope say the islands are from Chile. So the island now are Chilean islands, no more disputes. 40 years ago, we have some trouble with the British. Now we have a little war about the Falkland Islands or Malvinas Islands. Uh, we would try to win a war with the British Empire and we lose, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> if you come to Buenos Aires to do some secondments, we're going to have a lot of opportunity to, to dance, to learn tango dance, or to see shows very popular and very authentic. Here in Argentina, a lot of people dance. Uh, Tango because uh, like it. Also, you're going to see a lot of gaucho stuff. It's the popular culture, uh, rural culture, people related to the to the farmlands, to the very uh, um, related to the cows. You know, it's a lot of cow here. Also, we are going to get also barbecue, a lot of barbecue. About Argentina is uh, as you can see here, it's a very well educated country, uh, as Uruguay, our neighbor country. Um, Education is free at all levels, you know, high school, university. Also, it's free for all the neighbor countries. People from Brazil, from Colombia, come to Argentina to study medicine or architecture because it's free for everyone. Up to now, now we have a new ruler, more on the right side. Perhaps it's not going to be totally free for them. Uh, we have a lot of uh, scientific and technological tradition in Argentina. We get three Nobel Prizes in science. This is the second Nobel Prize we have in this time. You can you can you can uh, take take something, some champagne in a glassware. It was interesting time. And now it's impossible. Big trouble and safety. Uh, this is the this our, my lab, our lab, Laboratory of Biosensors and Bioanalysis. We we are part of the University of Buenos Aires and the Department of Biological Chemistry. We also are an institute from CONICET. It's called ICBISEN, Institute of Biological Chemistry, and CONICET. So we share the space between the two institutions. So we can ask money to the University of Buenos Aires and we can ask money to CONICET. They give little money. So the two monies, money for one and another institution, we get enough to work. This is our faculty. This is a, our new building. This is inaugurated two years ago. Something similar to the Bioscience Institute, I guess the shape. 
in some way. Uh, this is a big uh, building. This is uh, my lab. My labs are in this part of the fourth floor. If you come to Argentina, you're going to find a place uh, to sit, a computer, but perhaps possible not a private office because uh, we are a little crowd, a lot of people working in, in the university. Uh, as I say, my laboratory belongs to these two institutions, Yuba and Conicet. Yuba is a very big university, a very old, founded in 1821, about 3,000 students, 80 careers. And Conicet is a big research institution with about now 10,000 full-time researchers. Uh, I'm the leader of my group. Uh, we are about 14 people now. Uh, we have uh, six PhD students and three postdoc students. Also four people with permanent position. Uh, two of them are technicians. Or other two are researchers, full-time researchers. Uh, and about my group, we have a technological profile. We, we try to, to do research, to publish in the best journals we can but also we want to, to find practical topics where the research is good, but perhaps we can find someone that needs some technology for the company, the industry, the process. And our expertise area could be defined as bioelectrochemistry. My degree is in biology. Then I made my, my PhD working in enzyme-based biosensors, electrochemical biosensors. And when I finish my postdoc, I begin my group more related to microbial bioelectrochemistry. But now, as any group, every student have their own project. So we have a lot of diversity in, in my lab. My postdoc was, was in Canada with Susan Mikkelsen. That she made one of the first um, DNA-based biosensors. This is uh, my group, how it looks today. This is an old, old picture before pandemic. The ones in the back are PhD students. This is the last one, it's a Colombian one. The same happened with the scholarships. We have the scholarships, uh, anyone can, can be in the list. Colombians, Brazilians, we have now two Colombian uh, students, and one Brazilian student, PhD students. Well, this is a little list about the Five topics I'm going to talk now about science, about microbial fuel cells here. The, the, the later I'm going to talk a little about microfluidic using paper devices. Later about something about 3D printed devices. We use mainly material illustration. A little more about the microfluidic using PDMs chips. This is a new PhD students trying to work in this. And some about electrode materials because a system to be useful, need to be good, but also need to be very cheap. So we try to develop um, electro materials, very low cost and very friendly, ecologically talking. We're going to talk at the, at the end of the talk about biochar based electrodes, and also very cheap membrane, uh, membranes, because microbial fuel cells, they need membranes. Okay. <clears throat> As uh, Ivana said at the beginning, we are interested in, in developing biosensors and bioassays. Ouch. Um, and we get inspiration for this. It's a, it's, a, it's a typical thing when we introduce a biosensor talk, the canary in the coal mine. So uh, more than 100 years ago, uh, when you go to a, to a mine, uh, you go with that canary. You know, sometimes the rescue teams use a canary because the canary is like a precursor of the biosensors. If the canary goes wrong and gets uh, some problem because there are carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, or another asphyxiating gas, uh, but they have odorless, the miner can know that some problem is happening and then can run. Um, same principle applies now for the early warning systems. Uh, a lot of rivers uh, in Europe and US, USA, they have uh, stations, fixed stations in the rivers to, to take an early warning if something happens with the water. Some uh, could be a sabotage, could be a spill from a company that is not informed. So this station can alarm 
and the water purification uh, companies shut on the inlets of water for the rivers. So something about microbial fuel cells. And another, another best, best is biolithochemical system. Could be microbial fuel cells, could be enzyme-based enzyme microbial fuel cells, or could be electrodes modified with enzymes, microorganisms. But what are microbial fuel cells? Well, uh, at the beginning, we can say that the working principle is very similar to the very popular uh, my, um, hydrogen fuel cells. So there are two compartments in, in a, in a polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cell, that the one that is used for power up cars. You have a, one membrane that is permeable to protons. Is this in this case is a solid electrolyte. This membrane separates two compartments. One compartment you have the fuel hydrogen that is split using a, a catalyzers in the electrode in electrons electron flow to the other compartment. Protons can travel through the membrane and reach the other compartment. In the other compartment, a cathode, the oxygen is uh, reduced to water. Uh, using the protons and electrons that come from the other department. Yeah, this system, the electrochemical system is very simple, have no mobile parts, uh, becomes very popular when, for NASA missions to the space because for a spaceship, as the shuttle is very, very useful because you the only uh, exhaust you have from this system is pure water. You just carry compressed hydrogen, compressed oxygen. You get power for, for the your electronic system. You have some heat, some residual heat. It's good also for a spaceship. Uh, you get drinking water, it's distilled water, just adding some salts, going to be good. Uh, and our microbial fuel cell is very similar. You know, the cathode reaction is the same, oxygen that became water, the oxidant. But in the anode, you have bacteria or other microorganisms uh, living, forming a biofilm usually over the electrode. And these uh, microbes, uh, they are uh, the ones that are going to degrade the substrates, the organic matter, produce carbon dioxide, protons that travel to the other compartment and water. So it's very similar, but uh, well, no, you don't need catalyzers in this compartment, and it can be used to degradate any organic matter that could be a food for those bugs. This is uh, how you, you see a real system. This is uh, called the H system because it's like an H, and here in the middle is the membrane. Here is tubid because it's full of bacteria, and this is just water where you are bubbling uh, air. Microbial fuel cells can have a lot of application from production of energy. This is what the first application was proposed. Um, to a wastewater treatment or bio, biosensors, transducer for biosensors. Um, also for bioremediation, there are a lot of uh, application you can find. We're going to talk some, about something, some application we are working on in my lab. This is um, one, one paper we published, I guess, two years ago. It's about a paper-based microbial fuel cell. You, you have it here the two compartments. Uh, they are in planar, planar way. The membrane is in the middle. Uh, one compartment is the cathode. We replace the oxygen by ferro, ferry cyanide because it's an oxidant that can you can have higher concentration oxygen. Uh, Saturation in water is not too much, that's about six milligrams liter. You can put a lot of more ferro cyanide. And in the other compartment, we have the bacteria, which is Pseudomonas putida, because it's used in growing inhibition tests and it's regulated in one ISO uh, regulation, International Organization for Standardization. So we use uh, Pseudomonas, um, we, we use this very simple device as a, a biosensor to detect toxicity. Yeah, we, we named the, the paper to remove bottlenecks 
because most of the paper published using this kind of systems, they use a biofilm growing on the anode. But for growing a biofilm, you need a couple of days. So it's not going to be very fast, ni point of need. So we use a bacteria in solution in dispersion. So uh, we incubated the bacteria, the pseudomonas with the sample, could be toxic or not. And after an incubation, we measure the uh, electric characteristics of those microbial fuel cells. We use a methyl and blue, a medi mediator, because this kind of, uh, not any uh, bacteria can grow and produce energy in a microbial fuel cell. Usually they are a group, it's called electrogenic microorganisms that can grow over, the, forming a biofilm over an electrode and a direct, without any mediator, they can transfer charge, electrons to the electrode. But pseudomonas can't. So in this way, you need to add a mediator, as methyl and blue, these small molecules that can transfer electrons from the microbial metabolism to the electron. So this, uh, after the incubation of control and toxic samples, we simulate toxic samples with, sometimes we use a 3,5 dichloropenol, sometimes we use zinc, uh, they obtain these two different curves, you know, without, without toxic, you have more potential millivolts. If you have toxic, the potential is lower because the metabolisms of the microorganisms is depressed because they're toxic. So you can see that these very simple systems, because they are just uh, simple electrodes, we made this electrode uh, using an ink made of carbon nanotubes and ketosan, just by, by putting the one man number one paper over this ink. And we also do a very cheap membrane made of ketosan and polyvinyl alcohol. And this is a, a simple calibration curve we get. We got. So later we get some inspiration for the Viking missions to Mars because we believe that this system could be also be nice to, to look for life. No, uh, the Viking carry four experiments for looking for life in, in Mars. Basically, uh, they take a scoop of uh, Mars soil, they add some nutrients and see what happens. And they wait. If something happens, <clears throat> there is life present, it's broken down the organic compounds. There is no life, nothing happens, something like this. Always in um, carbon metabolism. <coughs> Sorry. Carl Sagan criticized us because they say, well, why all carbon metabolism? Perhaps in the Mars, they are alive, but they don't use carbon as to construct the, their molecules. So the, as microbial fuel cells are, are based in redox reaction, we present this kind of microbial fuel cells as life searching systems. More uh, That could be more useful that that the Viking experiment because they are not based in carbon. Now that's the matter carbon. Perhaps the life is based in silicon, but probably redox reaction they are uh, still important in silicon based life for to, to obtain energy. You know, it's more like a more general principle. Uh, here is Carl Sagan in Mars. No, not in Mars, but this, this is the Vikings. Very a big mission, very, very expensive, one of the most expensive missions uh, for exploration of Mars. Um, we find uh, this is Lake Magadu in Kenya. It's a very interesting lake because they, they live a, an archaea, microorganisms, Natrialba Magadi, um, that lives in very high concentration of uh, sodium chloride, about 400 grams liter almost saturated. Uh, we try different kinds of microorganisms to, to see if we can differentiate um, a sample that have life, microbial life, or is sterile. So we do experiment with this Natrialba magadi, it's a prokaryotic archaea. Uh, we use, uh, we do experiment with Saccharomyces cerevisiae, looking for uh, eukaryota organisms. Also we do soil samples. So when we do the experiment, 
we find that we can differentiate um, samples with life or without life. We publish this in Astrobiology Journal. And this is how you, you see what you get when you test a, my, a microbial fuel cell. You test a microbial fuel cell like a battery, like a, an hydrogen fuel cell. You do this kind of discharge curves. No, the, at the beginning, the microbial fuel cell is, is giving 500 millivolts. Then you apply resistors to the system, try to discharge the battery. And then the potential is going down, 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 and then reach close to zero. It's a discharging curve. And this is, with the same data, you can do this other curve. It's called a power curve that show you with the maximum power you can get. These are replicates, duplicates, duplicates. This is a sample containing life. Oh, high power, high voltage. And this is a control without life. In this case, it's still soil. So uh, potential is very low and power is very low. No? So we find this could work for heterotrophic life. We do the same for autotrophic life. For using archaea, photosynthetic archaea, and photo photosynthetic eukarya, we get the same. non sterilized sample and sterilized samples. And this is sterilized culture medium. Here, the current is a little uh, higher because you can sterilize a sample, but some enzymes are still working. We do the same. We publish this. Uh, we do the same, but uh, this is how it looks like the setup. And we need to illuminate in this case. Also, we have a membrane here, two compartments. This is anode with microorganisms, and a cathode is an inner tube. And the membrane is here. Also, we, we try to look for another metabolism. This is a chemolithoautotrophic metabolism. They are very interesting bacteria that grow over sulfur minerals and they use in biominery. And this is Rio Tinto in Spain. This uh, bacteria, Acidotiobacillus ferroxian, for example, are very acidophilic. They grow in pH about 1, 1.5, the optimum pH. Uh, they, are, they are autotrophic. They obtain their energy by oxidizing iron 2 to iron 3 in presence of oxygen. Uh, they are not too much energy in this reaction, this redox reaction, the iron 2 to iron 3. Uh, so they grow slowly. The duplication time is about two weeks. Also, we find that we, we can measure this kind of metabolism using a, a microbial fuel cells. Also, we can use microbial fuel cells to look for bacteria. Well, what, what about all this talk about microbial fuel cells? Well, uh, just I want to, to make you note, make you realize that could be microbial fuel cell can be a very convenient, low cost and fast sensor or transducer for a variety of applications where the number of total viable microorganisms need to be calculated. No, for example, soil microorganisms. Uh, if, if the soil is in good condition, uh, there are more microorganisms. Uh, about soil have less amount of microorganisms. Also, uh, wastewater treatment. The amount of microorganisms you have is critical because you have no microorganisms or the air population is going down. Treatment is going to be very bad. And the same in bioremediation process. Uh, we, we never try still to, to do these sensors, but it's close to what we already do. Uh, we work also uh, with paper-based devices. We use uh, paper-based devices to, to detect lamp amplification. This is a disease very common, not, not now, perhaps. It's transmitted by this bug, it's a pinchuca. So we, we are, this bug is, is controlled in some way. If there are no bug, there are no transmission of this disease. It's a, it's a flashlight protozoa, uh, produces a disease called mal de chagas. So we, are, we, are, uh, we get association with a group working in the lab reaction because we don't make a molecular diagnosis. We don't design lamp or PCR reactions, but they design 
Uh, and so we're trying to find a way to, to measure this very easily. Um, this is the way, very easily, and um, without without need to look the reaction at make AI to see the change of color, what they do already, and in trying to lower the volume. So we implement a system where we have a some kind of envelope, a device, a default, it's, a, it's just plastic, and the reaction occurs in a disk of paper, one more, number one paper, one centimeter diameter that contains all the reagents and the sample. Then we put this in a case. It's, it's, it's made of a, also plastic, a little thicker, acrylic. They, are, they have the two electrodes. These are the two, there are two electrodes. And then we close and we incubate. And we measure this kind of uh, C4D, this uh, conductivity measurement, like something like impedance. Measurement. It's made at high frequency, about 500 for 400 to 1 mega, 500 kilohertz to 1 megahertz it's radio frequency, and it's non contact uh, conductivity measurement. So we measure conductivity in this paper. If there are no amplification, nothing happens in the paper and the conductivity remains the same. But if the PCR or the lamp, in this case we use lamp, the isothermic, uh, isothermic uh, amplification, you get the, a change of conductivity because uh, magnesium reacts with pyrophosphate for by when the nucleotides are uh, broken. Uh, so also you have a, a lot of polymers now that because the chains of DNA are formed. So the change, the, the signal change because conductivity change. So we, we can in this way um, differentiate positive from negative reactions. Now we are improving the system, uh, better electronics and better uh, electrodes, because you know, here you have a, an emitter electrode and reception electrode, and because you are working in high frequencies, interferences are everywhere. You can hear the, the radio, perhaps, and electric uh, noise is very important. So now we are working in, in a, with the best, better setup, and we're trying to, to push a real-time lamp-based contactless conductivity detector. So the same, sample on paper, micropad, but instead in the, in the other, in the paper we already published, we measure conductivity before and after, and we compare. <clears throat> Positive, negative. So it's yes and not. But now we try to measure conductivity all along the process, along the lamp, one hour. So uh, we're going, we, we're trying to find something similar to the real time. So depending the number of amplicons you have in the sample, in the positive samples, uh, the change of conductivity is going to, to be seen earlier or later. So you can we can calculate probably the number of copies. Uh, using this kind of system, is uh, we can use very low volume samples, just one microliter, and um, we don't need dyes. We don't need uh, fluorescent dyes. They're just they're not so only expensive, but also they are toxic and it's not easy to dispose. It's going to be easy. Okay, we try also to do something about precision agriculture because you know we are um, a country that produces a lot of food. We produce food for 500 million people, and we are just 47 million people. And um, usually, well, like happening in a lot of countries, uh, fertilization is just, you know, uh, we do the same that my father do, things like that. So usually it's over, they are over fertilization in the, in the lands, in the fields. So that's imply more costs and uh, water pollution. Uh, river pollution, etc. So we are trying to, we are doing now uh, this kind of paper-based device, colorimetric. Uh, the signal is taken by a smartphone. At the same time, we take the position of the sample and we're trying to measure to do, we're trying to have nice curves for nitrate and phosphate. This kind of reaction for the micropod for two positions, and these are calibration curves. We try to push a kind of company looking for funding, you know, for 
this kind of uh, funds that that uh, give money to startup companies. Last year, <clears throat> we get a prize for a national competition, but not very good time to do business in Argentina now because of the big economic crisis. This was a uh, about the the group the the group we, we made, uh, including. Uh, Agronomic people, uh, industrial engineers, and this kind of people. This is uh, Federico Figueredo. He's the number two in my lab. He's in charge of the lab when I I travel to India, for example. Uh, also, uh, we realized that phosphate also could be a very good indicator for to know if a uh, is an amplification DNA amplification is positive or negative, because when the PCR or lamp proceeds. A lot of pyrophosphate is formed, pyrophosphate. Um, perhaps we can measure pyrophosphate directly or using an enzyme degrading to inorgate, inorgate, uh, inorgate, well, just phosphate. So using a molybdo phosphate reaction, we have a color. Also, it can be detected electrochemically. So there are phosphate in the media. The amplification is positive, no phosphate. The amplification is negative. But here there are some examples of what we get. This is uh, electrochemistry. This is a uh, positive and negative reactions. This is just a calibration curve for phosphate. This uh, is interesting. We are working this in this topic uh, also in paper based devices. But these paper devices are, they are um, the reaction is. Uh, it's monitored by change of color or by change of current. We have a new project involving the development of point of care devices for detection of periodontitis. We made an agreement with the, with the odontology school because they know about what they need. So the, the project is to have some similar, very simple paper device, something like this that measure five or six parameters. The people in odontology school tell us what parameters they need to measure. Uh, you know, we see the, the colors using an app. Uh, the app uh, giving a recommendation to the doctor or informing which uh, the degree of periodontitis. Uh, this is um, what I was thinking before I meet these people from odontology school was just a problem with your gums or your teeth, but it really affects systemically the body. And it's a, a lot of diseases related to periodontitis. It's, it's a more complicated disease. And now the students are doing some experiment in using drops because sometimes the paper interfere with the reaction. So they're trying to optimize the, the reaction using drops for the, some parameters. People's uh, in odontology say are important. For example, pH, iron 2, urea, nitrate, total proteins, and this is um, thiocyanate, that is a product of uh, produced uh, in the mouth by smokers. It's related to the to the smoking habit. <clears throat> uh, we do some work with 3D printed microfluidic devices. Uh, this is a typical device to 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 produce uh, drops. Yeah, um, Guillermo Martana in the last uh, uh, the last uh, scientific online lecture talked a lot about this, but we use this kind of tea system, <clears throat> oil plus spam, um, in this the other channel bacteria samples. Uh, so the bacteria are in the droplets. <clears throat> And we use the same um, conductivity sensor I told to you before. This kind of capacitive couple contactless conductivity detection because of that is C4. It's a, it's a kind of impedance sensor. But it's nice because the electrodes are never in contact with the sample. So you can use very cheap copper, every material you want for your electrodes because they are not in contact or with your sample and also your system could be, your electrodes could be part of the non-disposable system. And your disposable system just go up the electrodes. 
Well, we do this to count bacteria inside the droplets. We do some simulation about the electric field. <clears throat> the bacteria inside the drops add, act as insulators. So if there is no bacteria, we have more current. If they are a drop, this is a drop with bacteria, uh, the lipids in the membranes, and all the material bacteria have inside, also the walls, they interrupt the plus of current, is at, at, at the resistors, each bacteria is like a little resistor. So the current we can measure is, is less current. You see this principle, uh, these are replicates for blank samples and uh, drops that have a more a amount of bacteria from just something like 90, 90 bacteria a drop from almost 20,000 bacteria, bacteria, bacterium a drop. Uh, also, we can do a calibration curve about this and we publish this work. It was very simple, just counting microorganisms in a drop. Now, um, we are trying to do this same for one year from now, is one student is working, PhD students, in performing antibiograms using this. In this, uh, for doing antibiograms, uh, the drops are going to have the a fixed amount of uh, microorganisms. The one is, uh, is isolated from the, the patient, from the people who has infection. And then each each uh, ten each ten drops ha can have a different amount of uh, a given antibiotic. Or different antibiotics. Uh, incubation is going to be in the chip. <clears throat> uh, and the conductivity is going to be measured when the drop uh, begins the process before incubation and after incubation. So if the antibiotics have an effect, uh, the drops are going to have the same number of bacteria at the beginning, or less bacteria that the control drops, where the bacteria can grow without antibiotics. So it's going to be antibiotics in a drop using very low amount of volume, very low amount of region, very low amount of um, waste. Uh, we also are using the same system for anti antiviral encapsulation. We are thinking in a model with relatively big drops for delivering uh, eye drops for pets because it's more easy to implement something for beginning at the beginning for pets and then for humans. And yeah, we are using um, polyvinyl alcohol as a gelificant. It's a cryo cryo shell. So the, the gelification occurs when you froze and thaw the, these droplets. So you froze three times minus 20, and then the PVA microsphere became solid and, and key and remains solid. Uh, some results about the drop size and distribution and something like this. Yeah, we, as you know, as uh, Guillermo Martana says, by by changing the flow velocity from the two phases, the oil phase and the water phase, you can you can regulate the size of the droplets. We try to find more droplets with just one size, you know, to avoid any further purification or separation. We are doing something with PDMES uh, devices to try to do some lab on a chip. Uh, we have a company here that produce wine, red wine, and they want to um, to find a way to classify wines and to obtain uh, blends in, in a reproducible way. Uh, here, Cabernet Sauvignon is very popular. So we are doing this kind of uh, PDM chip, and we are, modif we are modifying the channels with carbon-18 compounds to, to make a, something like a reverse phase liquid chromatography column uh, with Electro electrochemical detection at the end. Uh, and we want to, to, to get something like this, something like a pattern, something like a fingerprint, and they use uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning to classify the wines and to uh, detect tampering also. But the company uh, really asked 
for a way to obtain reproducible blends. So the system needs to mix Cabernet Sauvignon every year. This Cabernet this Sauvignon a little different to produce the same Cabernet Sauvignon blend. Well, the last to finish this presentation, we are trying to to fabricate also a new materials for new, cheaper, greener, easy to dispose electrodes. So we are working with two groups that produce biochar. We have some biochar produced about this kind of Argentinian tea, the mate. We Everyone takes uh, at least two liters of water with this kind of tea. So it's a lot of waste. Uh, with this kind of uh, waste, uh, we pyrolyze using different procedure, the uh, reserva mate. And we, with this uh, material, this uh, pyrolytic material, we're trying to produce uh, inks. And uh, with the inks, we may paper-raise electrodes. Uh, we, sometimes we work something uh, like uh, screen printing, but we're trying to go to a more uh, efficient method to produce electrodes as, uh, as the, the methods that use the graphic industry as flexi graphy or rotor print, this kind of things. We characterize the biochar as, as everyone do, you know, pictures, um, nitrogen isotherms to, to know about the, the porosity, micropores, mesopores, nanopores, FTER, total composition, what kind of carbons. Sometimes we mix this biochar because of low conductivity with uh, graphite or with graphene, and we try to study the one typical reaction for one electrode to know if it works well, is the study the oxygen reduction uh, activity. And also with these electrodes, we have some cooperation with a group in Udin, Italy, and we're trying to use to replace this classic mercury drop electrode. It's an electrochemical method that allows to detect heavy metals we very low concentration of heavy metal. And we are doing uh, this kind of graphite uh, electrodes, uh, graphite plus biochar plus ketosan. We use a lot of ketosan, come from shrimp industry to do electrodes. And we do this kind of a stripping wave voltammetry to detect, in this case, a uh, lead concentration in water. Okay, perfect, I guess. It was just 45 minutes. Ah, 45. Excellent. Okay, yeah. thank you for your time. Now, question, answer, everything. I'm ready for. Well, first, uh, thank you, Eduardo. Really, really uh, very interesting lecture. And you really do a lot mm -hmm. of different things. And uh, like 98% uh, fully fits into what Biosense is working on. So even mm -hmm. with this uh, different uh, fabrication options and uh, even AI, machine learning, uh, but also for the whole Ipanema Consortium, I think it's extremely, extremely useful that you will be joining. The, I'm, the I'm very, very happy. My students are very, very happy. They are dreaming. Excellent. Uh, with, with Ipanema yeah. Consortium. On this note, we can finish the official online uh, lecture, so I will stop recording.